the, okay, uh, good evening good evening uh, to all uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, i'm dr padma gumbatna president sri lanka medical association uh, i'm glad that the uh, young members forum of the sri lanka medical association organized this uh, webinar on professionalism in medicine and uh, the actually uh, we started the young members forum in this year and uh, they had been quite active over this year and this would be the uh, last i think that uh, uh, they would be organizing for this year and initially it was uh, uh, initially it was uh, closer to it was uh, uh, something on environment and uh, now it is on professionalism they actually are planning to organize similar sessions more and more in the uh, in 2022 as well so uh, the uh, let me thank all of them for being very active and contributing for the SLMA for uh, its contribution for the medical profession. And uh, uh, let me thank Dr. Ashwini Abdu also for accepting the invitation to uh, moderate this. And for the speaker, Dr. BJC Pereira, uh, I'm sure that uh, he would do justice for this topic on professionalism in medicine. So uh, with that brief uh, introduction, uh, while thanking all of you for joining the Young Members Forum, let me uh, hand over the uh, uh, forum to uh, Dr. Ashwini Abdu uh, to uh, continue the proceedings. Uh, Ashwini, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Madam. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And on behalf of the Young Members Forum, it is my pleasure uh, to welcome our speaker, Dr. BJC Pereira, and uh, all participants uh, to this uh, webinar. One of the objectives of the Young Members Forum is to improve soft skills and life skills among young doctors and medical undergraduates. And this includes uh, professionalism, uh, managing ethical dilemmas, uh, self-care, uh, work-life balance, and so on. Uh, today, to speak to us, we have uh, uh, Dr. BJ C. Ferreira, who really needs uh, no introduction, uh, but I will uh, speak a few words uh, for those who may be new uh, to the activities of the SLMA and, and uh, who may not have heard him speak before. Uh, so Dr. BJ C. Pereira uh, is a specialist consultant pediatrician and honorary senior fellow of the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, University of Colombo, Sri Lanka. Uh, he is a joint editor of the Sri Lanka Journal of Child Health and a senior editor uh, of the Ceylon Medical Journal. Uh, he is the founder chairman of the Sri Lanka Forum of Medical Editors past president of the Colombo Medical School Alumni Association, past president of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, and founder president of the Sri Lanka College of Pediatricians. Uh, Dr. Vijay C. Pereira's CV goes on and on. Uh, I, uh, in the interests of time, uh, I will not go into it. But as you are no doubt now convinced, uh, Dr. Pereira has worked in many professional settings. He has played many professional roles as uh, a doctor, a <clears throat> pediatrician, a medical editor, uh, a mentor, a, me a medical educator, and so on. So uh, I'm sure we are all looking forward to uh, hearing uh, Dr. BJC Pereira speak uh, on this very interesting topic. Over to you, sir. Um I have been asked to talk about professionalism in medicine, uh, which is really a, a, a vast topic. So I will not be able to cover the entirety of it, but I will try and do some of the more important components of it uh, to perhaps make life a little bit more interesting. I think this will really be a session uh, somewhat of uh, storytelling. Something like once upon a time, there lived an extremely prematurely born little boy who went on to become a consultant pediatrician kind of thing. And the idea is to make you uh, co-creators and to make you connect with me and to focus your mind's eye and engage with me and to develop a cycle of rapport with me. Uh, when you look at the definition of uh, professionalism, uh, it's basically 
competence or skills expected of a professional. But a little more detailed one is that it is uh, that it is uh, commonly understood as an individual's adherence to a set of standards, code of conduct, and a collection of qualities that characterize accepted practice within a particular area of activity. Um, and it is usually so determined by either controlling authority or by the peers of the person concerned uh, themselves. But professionalism in medicine uh, has a, a multifactorial outlook and a variety of skills are needed. And uh, there are many different uh, aspects and perspectives. Basically, it works down to the way one reacts with fellow human beings who have some kind of a medical problem. So there are some cardinal characteristics of a profession. Uh, uh, these are the ones that are normally sort of listed in any sort of uh, article on professionalism. Uh, one needs to be competent in the profession. Uh, wherever that person appears, there should be a neat appearance like, um, reliable at all times, and a proper demeanor. Um, either in person, over the telephone, or online, and a good communicator in the same three media. And the behavior should be quite ethical. I'm not going to deal with that aspect at all in professionalism because that is a totally different and a, a very extensive topic that we need to talk about. Then we have the person should be well organized in all activities and more important than anything else should be accountable for all his or her actions. <coughs> there are some uh, essential traits of a profession. The person needs to be dependable, be respectful, and that means be respectful to not only the highest in the land, uh, but also to the poorest of the poor. So everybody. Um, and that sort of covers a very wide group of uh, or wide range of uh, uh, the population that one may have to deal with as a professional. Person needs to be ethical. I've said that before. Uh, be positive in the approach to the profession. And of course, be a team player. No professional can work properly unless that person is a team player, period, full stop, because that is a very important criteria. And of course, one has to always try to try to be the best. So it's something like mirror, mirror on the wall, am I the best of them all? It may not always answer saying yes, but one has got to try. Now, medical professionals, when people refer to medical professionals, very often they tend to restrict it to the doctors. But of course, there are other medical professionals like the nurses, pharmacists, dietitians, physical and occupational therapists, medical technology, social workers, and maybe a few more that I have not listed here. <coughs> but for our purposes today, I think we are going to concentrate on professionalism for doctors. Now, there are four important attributes of a professional doctor who behaves in a very professional way. Uh, one is one the, the most important one, perhaps out of all, is patient centricity. That means the patient becomes the central figure and it's not the doctor. It's not doctor centered, it's always patient centered. Now, these are very important concepts that has been realized relatively recently um, because earlier, not so long ago, everybody seemed to look up to doctors and we were the center of uh, interest. But uh, perhaps now it's changing the world over that the patient should be the center of all interest and activity. Then humane care. The person needs to be kind, caring, gentle, helpful, compassionate, civilized. All those practically refer to more or less the same thing. So because as a doctor, I think, you know, you have to have all these qualities or collectively they are called humane care. Then obviously for uh, more reasons than one, integrity of the person is quite important. 
one has to be honest truthful honorable and upright in all his or her dealings and the person as i said before once again even more important as a doctor has to be a team player because the doctor has to relate to very many different people even in the care of patients it's not only sort of only the nurses but everybody else who are involved in the care of patients so that it's important to have the ability to work in collaboration with others now just in my own field professionalism for pediatrician i think uh, this is useful perhaps for you because it applies not only to pediatrics but to all other specialties as well because this is something that was given in by the american board of pediatrics so there are whole load of things that i have listed here uh, and uh, you know if you look at all that you know everything means kind of kind and decent behavior and one's integrity being maintained uh, and um, one is reliable and responsible uh, and one has compassion uh, and has empathy for the patients and also the last one altruism and advocacy because unselfish devotion to the welfare of others uh, patients included obviously but patient well being should be the primary motivating factor uh in patient care ahead of one's own interest as a doctor and the needs of uh yourself as a doctor and of course selfless concern for the welfare of others uh, 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 a a real hard task very often to fulfill but these are the requirements and these are as uh, declared by the american board of pediatrics now there are important responsibilities and values that have to be inculcated in a doctor one has to be responsible to patients and their families the doctor has to be responsible to other healthcare professionals and responsible to the profession and the doctor definitely has responsibility to the entire community now if you can fulfill all these i think quite a major part of the professionalism of your good self as a doctor is fulfilled now work in the hospital it's essential for one to be punctual if you are a decent professional um and be pro properly uh, properly attired at all times uh, sari for the ladies short sleeves and tie for the gents uh, and obviously shoes not kind of barter slippers and that kind of thing when one works in a hospital and one has to be responsible be diligent and conscientious be honest and document properly uh, in the language uh, of her majesty that is english and i will tell you a personal anecdote after this if you have heard that before i ask your pardon uh, but um, i think it is of interest here uh, and uh, remember that your proficiency in english becomes quite important because nobody will make any allowances for you because it's a second language because it's our working language we do everything as far as medicine goes in english we study in english we prescribe in english we document everything in english so english becomes a very important um, uh, language for this and um, in that sense all this kadua and ayamalli and akkanangi uh, all that probably should not be used uh, and um, it is important for everybody to be conversing in english uh, with your fellow professionals as well as the other um, doctors and people who with whom you work and of course one needs to be disciplined so this is a very broad overview of uh your kind of the way you deal with things when you work in a hospital there 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 must be a lot more than this but these are perhaps the only important things um now i take you back i said i will tell you an anecdote this is the first story i'm going to tell you because i said this entire thing will be full of stories um i take you back to 1960 and 1961 uh, perhaps before many of you were born you no know? and uh, about the english language 
Now, in 1961, uh, I was um, uh, put into the GC ordinary level first year, what used to be called senior prep uh, year one class. And suddenly, from the singular medium, I had to switch over completely to the English medium. And my command of English language was, to say the least, absolutely atrocious. I couldn't speak in English and I could barely write, you know, sort of connect up a couple of sentences, but nothing more than that. Although English was a subject in school and I was at St. Peter's College, uh, Colombo 4. And at St. Peter's College, in this English class, we had a whole load of uh, children, uh, boys who were uh, burghers from the area and also quite a lot of Tamils. And they were not very proficient in uh, Sinhala language either. So English was the medium of communication for all of us. But then I was so poor in English that there was a burger boy seated next to me by the name of Ralph Menaces. He, he became a doctor later. Uh, you might uh, remember him as a very well-known bass guitarist in a band. Um, I had not actually spoken to him for one year because I couldn't speak to him in English. <coughs> so at the very start, as uh, uh, in a class on the English language, uh, the teacher got us to write an essay and he took the books home and uh, brought the books back next day. Uh, he had marked everything and given marks and corrected the things. He gave all the books to the boys, but kept one book back. And that book was mine. And the teacher was a burger gentleman as well. I think his name was Mr. Clive. Uh, and he called me to the uh, platform, the podium, and he was trying to tell me in English what kind of rubbish I had written. And I couldn't, I couldn't communicate with him in English. So I was trying to tell him in Singhala what brilliant English I had written. So there was a complete um, uh, sort of standoff. Uh, he couldn't understand what I was saying in Singhala, and I couldn't understand what he was saying in English. And uh, then he came out with a sentence, uh, I think we changed my life. And I owe my entire future to that teacher who said a sentence, who, who actually uttered the sentence of seven golden words. You will not get anywhere without English. You will not get anywhere without English. And then that actually at least sunk in to me. And I had to try very hard. Uh, I don't want to go into all kinds of details in this, but just to mention that my father, who was a colonial public servant, uh, who had gone on to the government public service after, from that time onwards, uh, from the time he got um, uh, independence. Um, now, he was very proficient in all three languages. My mother was proficient in all three languages. All the English newspapers were there at home. Dictionaries were there at home. But I was so stupid that I never made an attempt to learn this language. And in the evening, in our veranda, there was a queue of people waiting to get my father to write letters in English to the government. He never charged any money, uh, but uh, there was, I mean, that was the kind of thing. I, I mean, English was something that was there in the household, but this, the stupid fellow that I was, I never made an attempt. So I started going to the library, got all the books, and it's a long story. I had to try very hard uh, and I had to burn the midnight oil <coughs> virtually every day to try and develop some kind of competency in English. And at the end of a very hard first year, I was reasonably okay with English. And at the end of the second year, when we had to sit for the GCO level examination, I was on par with my peers. 
And then I continued all my attempts to improve my control or command of the language. And therefore, when I got through the O levels and got on to the A levels, uh, by the time I sat for the GC A levels, I was ahead of my peers. Now, many actually do not even believe this story now, uh, but I have no problem with this story. It's God's own truth. And I purposely relate it to encourage others uh, to learn this language, it is so important. <coughs> and 15 years later, the real fruits of this endeavor were enjoyed in England from 1975 to 1978 and in 1982 and 83, I did two stints in England. I could hold my own quite comfortably, even against the British. I had no trouble in doing the paperwork in England uh, because that is an important component, very important component of working in England. And the real feather in the cap and perhaps the jewel in the crown was when I actually sat for the MRCP UK examination uh, in 1976. There, uh, I had a patient, um, um, uh, an elderly lady who had been a kind of a professional patient who was coming in for the exam regularly. Uh, at the end of uh, the thing, uh, once I had come finished, I had about 10 minutes free. And she and I were having a chat. And this lady asked me, uh, doctor, which year were you in Oxford? So I said, I beg your pardon, ma'am. I mean, I, I, I have not been to Oxford. I never studied in Oxford. And I really don't know where Oxford is even. She said, it can't be. I said, why do you say that? Um, then she said, you speak the most perfect Oxford English. So I had no answer to that. But I said, what is Oxford English? She said, have you heard our Queen speak? And I had actually heard and seen the Queen speak over the television. So I said, yes, I have listened to her and I've seen her very many times. She said, she speaks without an accent. And that is Oxford English. Of course, I was lucky enough, I passed that exam uh, that time. Uh, so that was, I think, one of the best compliments I ever had for all the effort that went into developing my language skills. Now, against this, now this is a, a, a direct uh, transcript of a, a letter written by fully qualified board certified uh, subspecialist pediatrician. I think it's, it's the people who are at the highest levels of qualifications in pediatrics. Now, this is what they have written. I don't think we need to read through all this. And this is what they have written officially in an official communication to the Sri Lanka College of Pediatrics. Now, here is the same transcript with all the errors that are there as far as language is concerned. So this actually broke my heart when I saw this uh, because uh, uh, the younger pediatricians, at least some of them, uh, this is the way that they were going to communicate even in writing uh, with the Queen's language, which was uh, <clears throat> so, to say the least, quite painful to see. So to develop fluency in English, you have to read voraciously. It improves writing and speaking as well. You have to write legibly, obviously, and speak in English whenever and wherever possible, and appreciate people correcting your English. Don't take it as a personal affront. And do not get into, the, obviously, the Kadua culture and give up the Aya Mali Akkanang language and do not be scared to converse in English. And there is an anecdote here as well. And of course, one has to learn from one's mistakes. The anecdote is um, at an international conference for the editors, uh, myself and my co-editor, um, Dr. Lucas, we were both there. And there were people, editors from right around the world. And the organizers one day walked up to me and said, you know, there is something quite unusual about you and uh, Dr. Lucas. 
you all never speak to each other in your own language. You all speak to each other in, uh, in English, whereas everybody else from the African continent, uh, from um, America, uh, from the West Indies, um, all over the place, Asia, they speak to each other in uh, their own language. <clears throat> Why is that? So I said, very simple, we work in English in the country. So that was that. So that was again, I think something that was noticed by them uh, to be um, uh, quite, a, quite a different uh, thing compared to all the other editions. <coughs> now, one important component of uh, professionalism is the ability to listen to others. Listen to others around you and not only to your patients, but to everybody else around. And that means do not be so arrogant that you think you are it, that you develop a kind of an I syndrome, what I usually call an I syndrome. It's always I, 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 but nobody else. So I will take you back in another story into a saga in 1973. When I was a pediatric registrar at Lady Regina Hospital, and obviously you can see quite a change in the appearance at that time. Um, and uh, uh, I, there, that time, we had one consultant for each ward, one registrar, no senior registrars, no senior house officers, and just two interns. And once a week on your casualty day, you're on call for the entire hospital. So you go and do a round of the entire hospital, except of course the professorial unit, because they had their own arrangements. Um, but all the other, I think about five or, or six medical units, uh, that particular registrar had to cover. So you start around nine o'clock in the night, you go around the entire hospital, try to sort out all the problems that are around, and then finally you end up in your ward where admissions have started uh, from, I think, about eight o'clock in the night. <coughs> so one day, uh, that day, uh, I was on call on Tuesdays. It was a casualty. I was in ward four LRH. The casualty day was Tuesday. And uh, it, uh, it was a particularly bad night. Actually, All the other wards had a lot of problems. And I had to sort out all those. And I kind of staggered back to my ward, you know, around midnight. Uh, and luckily for me, the two house officers, they are said, uh, uh, no problems, you know, all routine kind of admissions, nothing very drastic, uh, nothing at all. So I said, okay, I'm, I'm really tired. Uh, I need to get to bed. Uh, I will go back to quarters because I was resident in quarters, which is, um, just about, you know, kind of um, virtually about 50, 50 meters or less away from the ward. Uh, then one of the house officers, a gentleman by the name of Pali Pereira, who was also known later on as Budget Pereira for some reason, who later became a consultant, uh, obstetrician, and a gynecologist, <coughs> he said, BJC, please don't go. I said, why, Pali? I mean, you, you said there are no, no problems. No, 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 don't go. Please wait. And I said, what man? You know, everything is under control. Why should I wait? And I was getting almost a little bit annoyed as well. He said, no, please wait. Please wait. I said, okay, I will wait. Uh, but why? Then he said, there is a baby over there in a cot. I don't like the look of that baby. So I said, okay, let's go and have a look at the baby. So you we went, uh, it was an infant. Um, I think it was an infant. Um, and uh, uh, I examined the child. It come with a kind of uh, lower respiratory tract infection, was not even this sneak, um, and uh, was not very ill. Didn't even have a temperature. So I said to Pali, this baby is okay there is no 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 don't go please wait so actually to because i listened to him i sat there and waited it didn't take even uh, i don't think it took even 15 minutes all hell broke loose um 
and uh, the this particular baby stopped breathing arrested and uh, the mother was wailing everybody were running around in circles shouting all over the place uh, and uh, the whole pandemonium broke and we went running and i could see that the right side of the chest of the baby was kind of bloated like a balloon so obviously the child had developed uh, 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 pneumothorax attention pneumothorax uh, and uh, obviously if that was not attended to the child baby would have died very quickly so i had no hesitation i just stuck a needle down to the second intercostal space uh, on the right side and he really all whole load of air whistled out uh, and then i connected that to uh, uh, uh underwater seal uh, mechanism the baby started breathing again and uh, i shuddered to think what would have happened if i didn't listen to that house of that is why i say listening is so important because if that happened with me in a quarters in my room there wouldn't have been time for me to get back there by the time they got through to me the child would have been dead and the two uh, interns would not have had the nerve to put a needle into a chest um so there you are that's what happened second in the past space and uh, uh, a needle to relieve the tension in the thorax the child went home uh, we kept him for quite a little while uh, maybe after about a week or so i hope he is still alive somewhere uh, to prove uh, the fact that it's so important to listen to people i think that house of his upali had a sixth sense but whatever it is it's always useful to listen to these people a doctor needs to be intelligent dedicated honest hard working humane committed to the life long acquisition of new knowledge which become and skills which become quite important and very often uh, a part of your professionalism shows in your ability to overcome personal discomfort like particularly sleep deprivation for the sake of the needs of patients not for anything else <coughs> and this last one i have been at the receiving end quite a bit so here's another story i take you back to 1976 in nottingham uk and to cut a long story short uh, i was on call to the renal unit uh, over the weekend um i was the senior house officer the, lo the lowest form of uh, uh, doctoring life uh, which uh, uh, which survives in a renal unit Uh, because there were no pre-registration house visitor, no house officers, so I was the lowest. And you're on call from 5 p.m. on Friday to 9 a.m. on Monday, so that's the weekend. And I was the SHO in the Regional Nephrology and Transplant Centre. Uh, I was doing adult medicine, of course, um, because we had to do the MRCP in adult medicine. There was no pediatric there. And that weekend, for some reason. we had to do four yes four renal transplants because all the european transplant registry matching of available kidneys there were four available and all four had the best match for four of our patients now i was the jona there because uh, if you have one transplant for a week it means a lot of work for you to because when you do a transplant there are so many things that you have to do um and it's practically 24 hours work continuously before and about 48 hours work after the transplant and i was when you think of four renal transplants uh that was done on over the weekend i was just absolutely inundated with work i had no sleep on friday and no sleep on saturday and no sleep on sunday and then came the morning of monday and uh, the consultant nephrologist came in to see how things were going he was a young very aggressive uh, nephrologist but i got on very well with him because i had no hesitation in arguing with him and uh, uh, somehow we got on very well he looked at me and said are you all right I said, "Oh, I'm fine. Uh, no problem. I must have shown on my face because I hadn't had any sleep for three days, three nights." 
and uh, then the sister you know they are not like the sisters in this country they will speak up even to the consultant so he said no martin uh, his name was martin nap um uh, no this boy is not all right i mean she was a elderly person she could call me boy um this boy is not all right he has not had any sleep for the last three, three nights so my boss said okay you go back to quarters now right and relax we will run the place i said i'm very sorry i'm not going i said look the four transplants we're just getting them round you know coming round nobody else will be able to because i know all about these patients nobody else will be able to do all this work. so i said i will have to finish all this work today and then only i can go and get some sleep then he said you're a danger to my patients i said i'll make sure that nothing will happen to the patients then he said okay then work the morning take the afternoon off uh, i said no you have your clinic in the afternoon who's going to do the clinic he said no no we'll manage you take off i said nothing doing you can set me tomorrow if you want but i'm not going anywhere i'm going to do your clinic as well so once again uh, when everything finished i was supposed to be off at 5 o'clock but i finished that night at 8 o'clock i just went back to my flat in the hospital itself i just fell into bed and that's it by next morning i was quite okay so that's the kind of thing that has to be done then the second was my second job as a registrar in general medicine at uh, crawley hospital in sussex which is about 30 miles of london <laughs> in the year 1977 Now, one of our patients and a 16-year-old girl with severe ulcerative colitis, admitted with a distended abdomen and was quite ill, we managed to resuscitate her and contacted the surgeons. And uh, the answer was to do a total colectomy, otherwise she was going to die of uh, of a uh, uh, sort of sort of you know a, a, a really disturbed and diseased um, uh, colon. Um, and uh, that could have ruptured any moment so she needed to have a total colectomy and an ileostomy in the late afternoon so we had to talk to all the parents the patient everybody convince everybody and send them to the theater and before sending the child to the theater i called the sister and gave her strict instructions on two powerful antibiotics doses to be given just before the child went for to uh, the theater for surgery so well she went to the theater uh, we got on with our work and then about 5 o'clock i got a frantic call from the theater from the surgeons where all hell had broken loose in the operating theater and just halfway through the uh, total colectomy um the she had collapsed dropped her blood pressure to her boots developed tachycardia uh she went into shock uh and whole clammy extremities and everything and the surgeons found it very difficult they barely managed to do the uh, operation and then gave me a call uh, about 5 o'clock and said look this child is not going to make it she she uh, she's going to die and uh, i said what on earth i mean we resuscitated the the child before sending what happened I said we don't really know she's in shock so i said okay that was by the time we finished all that and they, they, she had recovered from the or kind of apparently recovered from the anesthesia uh was around 6 pm i told them now send her to the medical intensive care unit where i was in charge and not in surgical intensive care unit i was going to see what i could do for this child so the child was brought to the medical intensive care unit my god she was at death's door Uh, and um, she um was going to die obviously um she had a central venous pressure which was way down and fluctuating around all over the place blood pressure was practically unrecordable uh and she was unconscious um cold clammy extremities and a tachycardia of kind of 160 range uh and uh, things were bad and then it was a full night of hard work 
a full night of hard work. I had to change the drip rate practically every 10 minutes, depending on the central venous pressure. I had a long line in any way uh, to her. Uh, and uh, well, it went on. We used vasopressors. We did all kinds of things. Uh, she, well, uh, a blood pressure very slowly came up. Tachycardia persisted. But about two o'clock in the morning, she opened her eyes and she saw me because she knew me because I, I used to see her in the clinic. She knew me and she just managed to do a very tiny smile. I said, how are you young lady? And she said, I am okay, far from it. And then we kept on and kept going uh, like that. And by about six o'clock, she started to pass urine. Her blood pressure had come up. She was better perfused. Her tachycardia was beginning to settle and uh, it was all right. She had developed a gram-negative bacteremic or septicemic shock simply because the, the sister had forgotten to give the two antibiotics before she went to the theater. And when I found that out, I knew that it was our fault that, that she had got into all this trouble. So then she recovered uh, after that without any problem. I quickly went back to my flat, um, had a quick shower um, and all that. But now her mother was around at the same time then she saw everything that happened. Then I came back to Sri Lanka in 1978. And four years later, I got earned leave and went back to the same hospital, Trolley Hospital, as a local consultant. I was doing the consultant ward round <coughs> on a Friday evening and ended up in the regional isolation unit. Uh, because we had the regional isolation unit uh, attached to that hospital. We went to see a 20-year-old lady with a diarrheal illness who had been admitted. And she was in isolation because of the diary. And when I was about to go after changing the clothes and uh, all the sort of, you know, PPEs like things, um, the sister, who, uh, who was the same sister we had when I was a registrar, and she was a very lovely Irish lady. Uh, I was very friendly with her. Uh, and she, she gave me a huge file and said, uh, Chris, they used to call me Chris, this patient is in love with you. I said, Terry, how come? I'm happily married. No, nobody can be in love with me. And uh, then she said, let's go and see. I went in there and it was that Iliostin fish. It was Anne. She had got married. She was pregnant. And she had developed this mild sort of diarrheal illness uh, with stuff pouring out of her ileostomy. And that's why she was admitted. She came running. She hugged me and never let me go. Because um, I think they all knew uh, what I had done. That was one of the best experiences of my life. Uh, to see somebody for whom I sacrificed one night's uh, sleep. Then, of course, out of all those things that I had put in one of the sites before, one has to be humane, part of the professionalism of a doctor. Oh, to 1980 in Badulla. And uh, Badulla General Hospital, I was the only consultant pediatrician for the entire region, around 50 to 100 kilometers. I was just 31 years of age. Uh, I, had, I was a consultant and we had two interns, nobody in between, no registrars, no senior registrars, uh, no senior house officers, nobody. Well, of course, when you are that young, you are full of ideological beliefs and moralistic principles and kind of holier than thou attitude. And uh, one thing that was there was thou shall not take bribes. And that really was a lesson learned by me separately as a 10 year old boy in 1957. Um, when my mother was admitted to Ragham Hospital uh, at death's door and the doctors there didn't know what was happening. It was lunchtime. My father took me and went to see the consultant 
and gave him a, an envelope of 21 rupees. It is called 21 guineas. That is a consultation fee at that time. The doctor uh, who was in quarters, who had just finished lunch, took this envelope, counted it very carefully and said, Mr. Pereira, what do you do? And then my father said, I'm a public servant. I work in the telecommunication department. He said, Mr. Pereira, uh, you're a public servant. I'm a public servant, right? I shouldn't have to give you money to get you to do your work. Same way, you don't have to give money to me to do my work. I don't know what is wrong with your wife. I haven't seen her because I finished the ward round and came back. But of course, I will go immediately and see her. So uh, before we could get to the hospital, he was there examining my mother in great detail. And once again, to cut a long story short, my mother lived. And she had diabetic ketoacidosis. And in 1957, uh, hardly anybody uh, with diabetic ketoacidosis of that severity, now I know, would have survived. My mother survived and lived for another 30 years. Uh, and uh, there, that was um, a lesson uh, about uh, uh, doctors not taking bribes. And then in my third year as a, as a medical student, I had to do an appointment with Dr. Ernest Victor Pires, known as Ernie Pires, uh, as my first uh, clinical appointment. And I immediately recognized the doctor who treated my mother. And that was Dr. Ernest Victor Pires. And then I saw clinical brilliance at its best. Uh, and I learned so much from him. And the lesson I learned from that man, I have held very sacred right up to the present time. One might say that all of us are not angels. We are humans. We make mistakes. We lose our temper. We become inhuman at times. In uh, the words of the religion that I believe in, in, mea, in Latin, it's mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. Through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. So we make mistakes. And at Badullah General Hospital, I had this thing about bribes. And there was an elderly grandmother who once brought a, a parcel of um, uh, fruits and vegetables uh, home uh, because her grandchild was in the ward. And I was so bad, inhumane, that I refused to accept that because to my mind, that was a bribe. And I refused and closed the gate and she went away. And uh, when I came back in, inside the house, my wife gave me the uh, tongue lashing of my life and said, you are absolutely stupid. That is not a bribe. That is a token of appreciation on the part of a poor woman, right? Who has brought some, probably some vegetables and fruits in a, from a garden to give it to you as a token of appreciation and you chase her off. What you should have done is you should have called her into the house, accepted the thing, given her a cup of tea and then sent her away. Oh my God, I felt terrible. Um, and uh, so what can I do? I got into the car, went all over Badulla looking for this lady uh, to say, I'm so sorry. Please come back home with me. I couldn't find her. So I wouldn't be surprised if she went home and gave me uh, the proverbial um, uh, sort of up yours sign uh, because I think she probably lost a lot of faith in doctors through that. So that was a lesson that one really needed to learn to be human and humane. <coughs> and a lesson learned to be human Thou shall not take bribes. In Ratnapura in 1987, a baby with a febrile seizure was brought to the private sector when I was there early morning at about seven o'clock. And we, the mother was wailing and all kinds of pandemonium. We managed to get rid of all these people who were making a noise, sorted out the baby. And as I was getting into the car to come back to the hospital, uh, the father came running and gave me a whole big, word of notes. He was a gem merchant. 
So I said, look, you don't have to give me any money. I have been paid. I said, no, 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 sir. I said, no, 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 I said nothing to him. I got the bear maker. Uh, make a tiaganda. A people are balan. So, in two or three days, the child recovered. And when the child was ready to go home, I sent a message and got his father down. I said, How much money did you actually try to give me? I said, The entire morning's collection. I said, How much do you think it would be? Close to a lakh, one lakh. It's virtually two and a half times my salary at that time. So, I said, Now you would have lost that money if I took that. But please do something for the ward with that money, right? I will tell you what I need and do that. So we got all the cots and the beds uh, with brand new mattresses. I said this is useful because even if your child is a teacher, once again, that all these mattresses and things are all dilapidated, broken, and in with holes. Now I want brand new mattresses for all this. Covered in double layers of polythene so that you know it will not get spoiled. And uh, so he said, Certainly, very gladly I will do it. And that's what happened to that. Then, of course, one has got to say that sometimes one may have to pay for being humane. In the middle of a trade union action, a uh, strike by a trade union in Ratnapura, I was peacefully waiting at home. I was also not going to, I'm, I was not a member of the, the trade union, uh, but I was uh, not going to get into all kinds of uh, problems by going for work. Uh, the nurses, I was in quarters right behind the hospital. The nurses gave me a call and said, Sir, I was going to go to the hospital. None of the doctors came. So I said, okay, mama am going so I took, got into the car and came down, parked the car. It was the only car, uh, I think, that was there in uh, the doctors in, in the hospital. So I went and saw all the ill children. And I was about to come up. So I was not going to see the others. Uh, there was no house officers. There was no one, no doctors around. Um, <coughs> as I was trying to walk out, one mother came running um, with her child and said, uh, so then I ended up by seeing that one. Then all the other mothers brought their children, said, so I saw all of them. Uh, so it was virtually a, a ward round gun. So I was trying to be uh, humane for the patients who were there. So I did all that and came down uh, and I found my car splashed with the battery acid and a brand new car uh, completely splashed with uh, battery acid. So I had to get the entire car painted again. So you have to sometimes maybe even suffer for being humane. Uh, many a time, I think not in the very recent time or over the last two years because of COVID, because we are now put on a pedestal because we have done so much for uh, to look after the patients with COVID. But before that, the, the, these are the names that we were called, um, all kinds of things. And the one that hurt most is that they, they, they used to think that we are animals who put their stethoscopes on the wallets of patients. You might ask why. Now, the reason is that a total lack of professionalism. Because if you behave like a professional, they don't have to call us all those names. And American Board of Internal Medicine, once again, uh, says professionalism constitutes those attitudes and behaviors that serve to maintain patient interest above self-interest. That's exactly what I've been saying. So lack of professionalism leads to all these problems. Abuse of power, arrogance, greed, distortion of facts, lying, fraud, lack of conscientiousness, and various types of conflicts of interest. Uh, I have listed all that. I'm not going to go through all that. And this is the end result of a lack of professionalism, ladies and gentlemen. So this is the one thing that you have to guard against. And don't ever forget when you connect up professionalism with your own profession, don't ever forget that free education has given you everything. Our country and our people have funded you and your total education. As for me, 
if they if the education was not free i wouldn't be what i am today my parents would not have been able to afford all this if we had to pay for my university education and because of that remember that you owe everything to your motherland and its people so do not let them down um in a quotation a person said there's nothing in the world that one should take too seriously other than the suffering of human beings and this was said by late desamanya ken balendra in his biography autobiography in 2017 and how true that is that is our our job involves dealing with people uh, who are suffering suffering human beings so as a doctor you have to be a doctor who cares that shifting a child or a patient um on to a wheelchair or pushing a trolley with a patient in it no big deal it it is really uh becomes almost a part of your job you no know, when you talk of professionalism for doctors with some personal reflections uh in 1970 with mbbs second class honors at 23 years of age i thought i was the greatest very young man uh did not even for a moment think that i was a danger to the community but in retrospect i said he was because i was totally inexperienced and had only some theoretical knowledge <coughs> i hated pediatrics you may not believe it but of course not the children and in the pediatric internship only to qualify to sit for the adult md all they do is all the children do is cry pee all kinds of things they cannot hear a thing in the stethoscope and many used to die as i saw during few days but when you work with them children grow on you at the end of 6 months i kind of liked it we also realized uh, i also realized that we also cure a lot of them then on to career in pediatrics rather than general medicine and i was lucky enough to be a consultant pediatrics at 31 years of age today 51 years after that time that i qualified in 1970 the appearance has very definitely changed uh, ladies and gentlemen but i have no regrets whatsoever on the 25th of february 1964 cassius clay who later was uh, who changed his name to muhammad ali and knocked out uh, uh, the the reigning heavyweight champion boxer of the world um, and called himself i am the greatest i'm quite sure that many of you think that you are the greatest as well i know that in 1970 i thought so that i was the greatest but no doctor is really the greatest we are all human all of us have human weaknesses we also make mistakes we can only hope that the mistakes we make are not serious enough to cause major problems for the patients and we are not infallible sometimes being wrong can have a happy outcome we are wrong many times i'm sure but fortunately there are sometimes there is there are joys of being proven to be wrong and there will be a happy ending uh, as pediatricians we work with children and they are small miracles and we work with them every day but here is a miracle from ratnapura that i tell you that uh that when you are wrong it doesn't really matter sometime in 1986 or 87 there was a preterm baby in the special care baby unit who had a very large head at birth hydrocephalus then he developed and hydrocephalus was bad enough then he developed an intracranial hemorrhage and i told the parent that there was no hope at all they fell at my feet and pleaded please uh, help us do something this is the only child we got what do you do i knew very well this child was not going to survive and his hydrocephalus got worse because it got really obstructed he developed spastic cerebral palsy and uh, when we investigated him with the ultrasound scan uh, i think that time there were no ct scans of, uh, that were really available there but we got a ct done i think going the private sector somehow i think uh and the baby had just 2 mm of cerebral cortex left the rest was all fluid inside the dilated ventricles so i didn't expect this child to live 
uh, and told the parents so, but said we will do what we can. Kept the baby for a long time in the ward and then sent him home. We did not give him even a ghost of a chance. I was dead sure that child was not going to live. But the parents uh, had other thoughts. They looked after him. The child did not have head control for about three years. And for five years, he could barely walk. He was uh, completely spastic. But he had a reasonable amount of uh, mental abilities. Um, he could talk a little hesitantly, but then I told the parents, now look, put him into a normal school. So they had to carry him and take him because he couldn't do anything very much. He couldn't sort of walk around very much. So they gave everything to him. And uh, then when I left Ratnapura and went to Krunagala, these people followed me and kept on coming for follow-up and all that. We did all kinds of physiotherapy and all that. Um, tried our very best. And this child somehow uh, was doing reasonably well in school. And then they came and told me that for the GCE O-level exam, if I give a letter, the child will get extra time. So I very gladly gave a letter. And uh, he got an hour more for each paper. And he passed the GCE O-level with reasonable results. Then came A-levels. And in the A-levels also, I gave the letter and he got time. He did quite well in the A-levels. And believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, he entered the university. And today, when you look at him, he has got a bachelor's degree in arts from Colombo, two postgraduate diplomas, two master's degrees, two MA degrees, and he's now reading for his PhD. And if not for the corona, he would have finished his PhD by now. So I was dead wrong. And uh, I, I, I had given up prognosticating on the brain, on a child's brain, uh, long years ago as a result of very many experiences that I have had. Well, <clears throat> when I was asked to talk about uh, this professionalism, <coughs> I had grave doubts in my own mind because whether I'm the right person to have given to give this talk. Because if I can quote um, uh, somebody who described me, uh, perhaps the relation of a passion, uh, this is verbatim exactly what that person said. That's the um, uh, reputation that I had. All those uh, paper stations where I were. But now this is something that I have worried about all my life. But then the next two lines of the same thing that that person has said. Now I think, uh, although I don't like the first line, the next two lines, I think uh, uh, the next two lines uh, have compensated for that. There are vintage old wines that are stored in wine cellars. Of course, they do mature with age. Hopefully, like a good wine, I have mellowed with age. But then, I'm not quite sure whether like a good wine, we mellow with age, or is it as we age, we mellow with a good wine? Who knows, ladies and gentlemen, you might become someone that much better than me. And for those of you who would be doing, who would be working with children, uh, some of the most rewarding things about raising children is that children get ill very fast, but also recover as fast. We cure many of our patients and give back to society, an individual with a full life ahead of him or her. Professionalism needs to be developed as you progress in your professional life. 
there are some aspects of it need to be learned even by making mistakes. It has got to be nurtured. It must simply be valued as a priceless attribute. And even if you forget everything that I have said today, there's one thing, one word, if you remember that it will be equal to your advancing in your professionalism. And that word is empathy. And empathy is not the same thing as sympathy. Empathy means your ability to put yourself in the shoes of the patient that you would feel the same things that the patient feels. If you do that, you will be a professional. Now, this is ever camera ready uh, lady, my favorite uh, person um, who uh, worked for children in her own country and who also worked for children internationally. She was appointed as the eminent advocate for children, the world over by UNICEF in 2007. She is none other than Her Royal Majesty, Queen Rania of the Kingdom of Jordan. She is the Royal Consort of King Al Abdullah, the warrior king of Jordan. She once said at the end of a day, a position is just a position. A title is just a title. Those things come and go. And it is really your essence and your values that are important. So your essence and your values are the ones that will make you a proper professional. So remember that that is what counts in the long run. Now it's time, ladies and gentlemen, for me to offer a bouquet to two people <clears throat> who forced me to do this lecture. They cajoled me, uh, they sweet talked me into it, and even uh, kind of uh, coerced me into giving this lecture. I, I probably couldn't have done it because I was so busy the whole of this December with many other things that I had to do. But then these are two people who are uh, two of my favorites. I like them as friends very much. So I couldn't say no. So I burned the midnight oil and tried to make this presentation. And they are uh, the husband and wife duo. I think you all know them. Dr. Niroda Javikrama, um, uh, uh, Randini Kumar and Dr. Um, Sankar Randini Kumar. So thank you very much for asking me uh, to give this lecture. I've enjoyed it really. And also, uh, I always had my own sounding board at home. The person from whom I learned to be a professional. Unfortunately, she is not with us. She left us forever two years ago. So ladies and gentlemen, it is time for me to take my leave now. And in this image, you will see that I have highlighted two words, my leave. <coughs> and that is as a mark of respect, a tribute uh, to this great man, late Professor Carlo Fonseca. Professor Carlo Fonseca was a physiologist of eminence but he never taught me physiology because by the time he returned from England, I had finished my stint in physiology. But he taught me everything else. He taught me to do research. He taught me to write. He taught me to speak. He taught me to make presentations. Uh, and I have been always the richer for being able to go about on the shoulders of great men like him. And he used to come for my presentations, sit, quietly in a corner and list out all the wrong things that I said and gently take me to a side at the end and say that um, these are the things that you did wrong. And I prospered as a result of that. I learned. So I owe a great deal to this man. So 
So one day at one of my presentations, he told me at the end, uh, <clears throat> BJC, I was trying to find some fault with everything or anything that he said. Till your last sentence, I could not find anything wrong. And in your last sentence, you said, it is time for me to take your leave now. And he said, you cannot take anybody else's leave. You can take only your own leave. I was dead sure the great man was wrong. I thought I was right. I went back and checked the literature. And he was dead right. I was dead wrong. You can never say, take, I will take your leave. You always say, I will take my leave. And I have put this today as a tribute to this great man whom I miss so very much, who has been my guru all along. Ladies and gentlemen, for all of you who are still awake, thank you for your attention. And for those who are asleep, I think it probably they have to wake up. But if they are in a situation like this, I wouldn't blame them if they don't want to wake up. So farewell, my friends. This is the end of this talk. And I have to say goodbye till we meet again, hopefully. Thank you very much. Very much, sir, uh, for that very interesting uh, presentation and the discussion, which was, uh, I think, made even richer uh, by your anecdotes. Uh, I'm sure they resonated, at least one of those would have resonated with each and every one of us uh, who are together in this virtual forum today. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, now is the time uh, for Q&A. Uh, due to, in the interests of time, we cannot uh, entertain a lot of questions, but I am sure Sir would be uh, very pleased uh, to respond to any burning questions that you may have. Now please, um, uh, we have uh, one question here in the chat box. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you can um, either unmute yourself or put it in the chat box. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Ruchira Kitsiri, uh, who thanks you for your uh, talk and asks if you have any suggestions to instill punctuality among doctors who practice in private channeling centers. Oh, uh, I'm not quite sure in what context that you want me to answer that. Um, uh, when uh, you have to work in uh, private channeling centers, uh, you might get delayed to go there in the first place because other patients or your patients in the hospital have held you up. Um, and I think all you can do at that time is just before you enter uh, your room to see the patient, just apologize to the crowd who's waiting to see you. And everything else will be forgiven, guaranteed, because people realize that there are other patients, ill patients, who may have needed your attention. That's one thing. Second thing is that, especially at, say, in the morning, that if you are inclined to see some patients, say, from six o'clock or something where you have to report to the board at eight o'clock, Right? I think you really have to limit your practice. And you have to make sure that you get to your hospital at the appointed time. That way, only thing, only way in which you can do this, because I, I used to do this and I can say it quite clearly. I used to get to the, the ward very often, even in the periphery. You can ask all those people who work with me. Uh, I used to be in the hospital by 7.30 in the morning. And I used to limit the practice. And in the evening, I used to limit the practice because I had other things to do. And in the peripheries where I worked, this caused some problems because I was the only pediatric. So, the only excuse I gave them was Look, I really cannot see 
more than a certain number without complicating and jeopardizing what I could do for my patients in the hospital. But one thing I can tell them is that I'm the only pediatrician. My wards are always open. Our admissions are 24 seven, every hour, every minute. So if your child is ill, just bring to the hospital and we will look after the child. So, and it worked very well. They never held it back. And one day I went to the uh, head office. I'm not really uh, uh, praising my own tail, like a monkey praising my own tail. But these are uh, some of the things that happen to you. I went to the uh, head office for something and the director general called me in and said, come here, come here, come here. I have to tell you something. There is a letter from all the, uh, this was when I was in Badullo. All the MP signed by all the members of parliament in Badullo, which we have got addressed to me. And they are complaining against you. So I asked, sir, what's, what's the complaint? What are they complaining about? No, they are not complaining about your work. They are complaining that you don't see adequate numbers of private patients. So he said, this really is the best compliment that you can get, even from a politician. I didn't change my practices at all. So you have to really uh, limit, and you have to know your limits as much as, of course, you might start, you might get, because even in the private sector, you might come across some problem, you, which might need your attention. So you might get delayed by maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes, half an hour, maybe even one hour to get to the wall. But that should be the exception rather than the rule. But there are unfortunately people who routinely now, most unfortunately, um, uh, make it the rule rather than the exception. I hope I have answered the question that was asked that uh, what could be done. I know this is a huge problem. Um, I know that uh, this has been, but then if you are a profession, if there is professionalism around you, I think that alone will be the answer. Thank you, sir, for that very uh, thoughtful response. Uh, we have another question from uh, Dr. Vasana Jayaratna uh, from the Rajarata Medical Faculty. Uh, who asks whether she can share the presentation with the medical students, um, with your permission? Yes, by all means. Um, I have always believed that uh, whenever I have been able to climb up a ladder, it has been very sound advice given to me by a wise person uh, long ago, that every time you climb up a ladder, don't forget to put the ladder down for others to climb up after you. My pleasure and a privilege. By all means, circulate. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, we have another question uh, from Dr. Christian Xavier. Uh, how can we avoid pharma influence on practitioners? On the pharma influence? Yes, <laughs> on practitioners. Well, if you are a professional, if you are, if you have your integrity, around you, it was one of the things that I put in one of the slides. If you have your head screwed properly on your shoulders, right? I don't think pharma will have a chance. They can do all kinds of things, but still, I think your integrity will stand alone by itself as the beacon that you have to follow. I don't think the pharma will have influence. Um, and uh, they, because of some of the, uh, maybe the research work that I had done in, uh, in respiratory disorders in children, mainly in asthma. Uh, of course, uh, I was um, subject uh, to uh, uh, a lot of ways in which they try to influence. Um, and uh, it, uh, I'm happy to say 
um, that uh, they didn't really uh, have much success. We have one last question, ladies and gentlemen, because uh, I'm afraid I must uh, stick to time. Uh, from one Dr. Bandari, has any medical university incorporated modules on human values, sympathy or empathy in the MBBS curriculum? Did you say Dr. Bandari? Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Purushottam Bandari. Yes, he is. Uh, he, this must be Dr. Bandari from uh, my friend uh, from uh, Nepal or Bhutan, one of those countries. Uh, Dr. He Bandari is the, he's a postgraduate who came and worked in Sri Lanka and got our MD pediatrics. And uh, uh, I, I, I was, um, of course, at LRH at that time, and uh, he and I have been in contact. Uh, now, the question he asked. I'm not sure whether I'm the best person to answer this because in the curriculum, I'm not quite conversant with the curriculum of the universities. And Ashwini, you might be the best person to answer that, <laughs> uh, they're, they're, uh, being an academic in one of the universities. Uh, because whether the this kind of thing is there uh, uh, as, a, uh, as a kind of a module of, uh, of uh, knowledge acquisition, in a university curriculum. Sorry, Dr. Bandari. One thing that I'm not quite familiar with. There are very many things that I'm not familiar with. This is just one of them once again. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We have now come to the end of a very interesting lecture and discussion uh, on professionalism organized by the Young Members Forum of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. Thank you very much, Dr. B.J. C. Pereira, our speaker this evening, and uh, all uh, of you. Uh, actually, if I can, this, this, I think there is a comment um, uh, in the chat, because they say, yes, most of our medical faculties have professionalism stream. So uh, I think there is the answer, Dr. Bandari. Um, I think this is from an academic. Uh, that um, uh, they have very clearly stated that most of the faculty of medicine in Sri Lanka have now got um, uh, uh, the, uh, the professionalism uh, 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 as a module or a stream uh, that will be teaching them the basics of professionalism. So, well, that's a step very definitely in the right direction. Sorry, um, Asini, uh, I thought that was important uh, to be conveyed to the audience. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, there's one last question about medical ethics and medical professionalism. Sir, can we have a two minute answer, please? Uh, oh. To elaborate on the role of medical ethics on medical professionalism. Uh, medical ethics plays a, a very important role in uh, professionalism. But as I suggested in, in one of my earlier slides, that is a, a, a lecture in its own right. If you are going to talk about ethics and ethical behavior in, uh, in, uh, in your profession, uh, that will be a huge uh, 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 sort of chunk of information uh, and very many different aspects you need to uh, discuss. But one important thing is ethics and ethical behavior forms a very, very important component of professionalism. I hope that's all that I could do at the moment uh, because it's going on to uh, uh, another component of professionalism, which is um, probably a lecture in its own right. Uh, I hope someone will do that uh, very soon through uh, the same That is forum. perhaps a, a good topic for our next lecture in this series. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, all right. It, uh, so thank you again, sir, uh, for uh, uh, accepting our invitation. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your presence and your active participation. I wish thank you, you very all... much, Aswini, and it was a pleasure and very definitely a privilege. I wish you all a very pleasant evening. Good night. Thank you and good night, everybody.